Let's begin by asking what it is that we mean when we say the economy, and what it is that we mean when we say economics. Now, modern economy is typically a system through which money flows and in which various actors interact with one another based on money transactions to produce the goods and services that are ultimately produced in the country. And the first of those actors we're going to call households. So households purchase goods and services in what we'll call output markets. These are just places where goods and services are exchanged. And when households purchase goods and services, money flows from households into these output markets and then out to those who produce those goods and services, and we'll call those firms. But firms don't just sell goods and services to households, they have to buy inputs in order to produce the outputs that they can sell. So they have to purchase those inputs in what we'll call input markets. And the most important input that they purchase is labor. Labor is owned by households. And so when firms purchase labor, when they hire workers, money flows from firms through input markets, and then back to households. This gives us the simplest possible version of what we call a circular flow diagram, a diagram that shows the circular flow of money through an economy. Households purchase goods from firms, who then purchase inputs from households, and the money flows in a circle. But of course, it's way too simple a description for a modern economy. In this simple version, Households consume, will denote that with a C, and they also sell their labor to firms. But households also save money, and when they save, money flows from households into a third set of markets, which we'll call financial markets. But those financial markets don't just sit on that money. They make that money available for investment. So that money leaves the financial markets, and firms use that money to invest, to purchase office space, factory space, equipment, computers, job training for their employees. And all of those things are things that are purchased in output markets. So firms then also buy in output markets, except they don't do it to consume they do it to invest in order to produce other goods and services. So we'll call that investment and denote it with an I. So now we have households that consume, that sell their labor to firms, and that also save. But there's a third set of actors that households interact with, and that is the government. So the government collects taxes from households causing money to flow from households to the government. And the government makes transfers to households. They send checks to households in the form of social security checks or unemployment checks or welfare payments or stimulus checks during recessions. So those are transfers that go back from the government to households and we call them transfers or transfer payments. Of course, the government doesn't just collect taxes and then sends checks to people. The government also purchases goods and services. They build schools and roads and bridges and aircraft carriers. They hire school teachers and firemen and police officers. They hire a military and so forth. And all of those things are goods and services bought in the output market. So the government also sends money into output markets as it makes those purchases and we call those government purchases and denote it with a G. Now, if the government balances its budget, then that's the end of the story for the government. What it spends on government purchases and on transfers would be equal to the taxes it collects. But governments, of course, often don't balance their budgets. Oftentimes, they run deficits. Government purchases and transfers are bigger than the taxes they collect, and so they have to make up that difference. And how do they do that? Well, they go into financial markets. They borrow from financial markets to cover the deficit. 
but governments could also run surpluses and when they run surpluses they pay down debt and money flows from the government into financial markets so this error could point in either direction depending on whether the government runs a surplus or a deficit so now we have a more complicated picture of an economy where government households and firms interact with one another but it leaves out one important thing the rest of the world so we're going to denote the rest of the world as ROW, rest of the world. And the rest of the world interacts with us in both output markets and financial markets. In output markets, the rest of the world buys goods from us. We export to the rest of the world. And when that happens, money flows from the rest of the world into our output markets. So that's what happens when we export to the rest of the world. But we also buy goods from the rest of the world. When we buy goods from the rest of the world, we import. And when we import, money flows from our markets to the rest of the world. So the arrow points in the other direction when we import goods. When we subtract imports from exports, we call that net exports and denote it as NX. So NX is just exports minus imports. If NX, net exports, is positive, that means we're exporting more to the rest of the world and we're importing from the rest of the world and we're running a trade surplus. When net exports is negative, then we're importing more than we're exporting and we're running a trade deficit. So the net flow of money depends on whether net exports is positive or negative. And the rest of the world interacts with our financial markets. They might lend money to our financial markets, in which case money flows from the rest of the world into our financial markets. Or they might buy US assets, stocks and bonds, in which case money flows from the rest of the world into our financial markets. Or they might borrow money from our financial markets, in which case money flows in the opposite direction. Or they might sell assets like stocks and bonds, and that would also cause money to flow in the opposite direction. So now we have a depiction of an economy that includes the government, households, firms, and the rest of the world. And it illustrates a simple picture of how money flows in that economy. Now when we then want to figure out how much does this economy actually produce, all we have to do is add up what's on this side, add up what's flowing through these output markets. The level of production in the economy, the level of production of goods and services, includes how much households consume. It includes how much firms buy in these output markets for investment. It includes how much the government purchases. And then we have to think about how do we include the rest of the world? Well, if we're interested in determining how much this country produces, then we don't want to count what consumers consume but what was actually produced in the rest of the world. We've already counted that in consumption, so we have to subtract it back out. So whatever we buy from the rest of the world has to be subtracted back out. In addition, whatever we produce but doesn't get consumed in this country, but gets consumed in the rest of the world, is something that gets produced in this country. So whatever we export has to be added back in. So we have to add net exports to this. And when we sum all of those together, we get what we call gross domestic product, GDP. The sum total of all the goods and services produced within the country. Now this is a depiction of what we mean by an economy. And economists study this system as a whole. And we study that in a branch of economics that's called macroeconomics. Macroeconomists think about this system as a whole and try to determine what determines how much of what's being produced is consumed, invested, bought by the government, or makes it into net exports. They study under what circumstances is there going to be unemployment in this system. Will there be a recession? How does inflation emerge? And they think about how does an economy grow 
in the long run? Or alternatively, why might it stagnate? So those are all questions about the system that we call the economy. And macroeconomics studies that and the questions that surround that. But that's not all of economics. There's a second branch of economics called microeconomics. Microeconomics is all about the decisions that we make that are based on costs and benefits. Microeconomists don't look at the system as a whole, but they look at components of the system and how individuals trade costs and benefits off against each other. And this applies to all decisions that people make where costs and benefits are relevant, not just those decisions that involve money costs and money benefits. Certainly, lots of decisions that get made in this economy by households, by governments, by firms, by people in the rest of the world are based on trading costs and benefits off against each other and are based on money costs and money benefits. And microeconomists will study those. But they'll also study situations where people are making decisions where there aren't explicit money costs and benefits. When you decide how much to study for this course, you are making an investment of your time and your effort and your energy. And you might get the benefit of understanding economics better, understanding the world better, maybe getting a better grade. You're weighing costs and benefits as you make the decision on how much to study for this course versus other courses versus doing other things in life. And so you're trading off costs and benefits, yet none of those have anything to do with money. Many decisions that we make as human beings are decisions where costs and benefits aren't primarily about money. And so microeconomists study all of those, including those that do involve money that are contained within this picture. So this is why economics as a discipline has a rich and broad landscape, because it really concerns itself with all decisions that human beings make where costs and benefits are relevant, whether those include money or not. So as we progress through the course, we're going to begin as microeconomists. We're going to zoom into different parts of this picture and think about household decisions and firm decisions and government decisions and so forth. We're also going to think about decisions that aren't explicitly included in this picture of the economy. Decisions where money isn't the primary reason people are making trade-offs between costs and benefits. And so we'll see and explore that richer landscape of what economics touches. It really touches almost all spheres of human life because it deals with all situations where we make choices and almost all choices include weighing of costs and benefits. Then, later in the course, we're going to turn to macroeconomics. We're going to zoom out and we're going to look at this whole system and we're going to think about the kinds of questions that macroeconomists think about that requires them to think about the system as a whole rather than individual components of the system.